Judge Peter Cahill will issue today's sentence. He is the same judge who presided over Chauvin's trial eight weeks ago. You may remember the jury deliberated for nine hours, 44 minutes, over two days before finding Chauvin guilty on all three counts. Now, by state law, he'll be sentenced to the most serious of those charges, second-degree murder. The maximum sentence for this charge is 40 years, but the guidelines recommend 10 to 15 years on that conviction. Now, the judge has already ruled aggravating factors in the case allow for a stiffer penalty. Those factors include Chauvin abusing his position of trust and authority and the fact that all of this unfolded in front of Minnesota children. Let's Derek listen right Michael here. Chauvin. Here is Judge District Court file number 27, CR 2012646. Matters on for sentencing. Counsel, note your appearances beginning with the state. Good afternoon, Matthew Frank, Assistant Attorney General on behalf of the state. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Jerry Blackwell from the state of Minnesota. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Steve Slusher on behalf of the state of Minnesota. Your Honor, Keith Ellison, Attorney General on behalf of the state of Minnesota. And for the defense. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Eric Nelson and Amy Voss appearing on behalf of uh, Mr. Chauvin. Thank you. Uh, we are still, uh, for all those attending, under somewhat modified COVID restrictions, so we are asking that everyone keep their masks on unless they are speaking. I'll ask for people who are speaking uh, to come up to the lectern and use the microphones and please to remove your mask so that we can hear you clearly uh, and also to maintain the distances that we have set out in the courtroom. Uh, with that, we'll proceed first with the state. Mr. Blackwell, you may proceed with victim input. Your Honor, we have four victim impact statements. Uh, we will start uh, with the seven-year-old daughter of uh, George Floyd, uh, Gianna Floyd, who will uh, present hers by video. What do you miss most about your daddy? Well, I ask about him all the time. Mm. And that's kind of it. Yeah. Well, when you ask about him, what are you asking about? Well, I was asking, how did my dad get hurt? Do you wish that he was still here with us? Yeah, but he is. Through his spirit? Yes. Yes. And when you see your daddy again one day, what do you want to do when you see him? I want to play with him. What kind of games do you want to play with him? Um, I want to um, play with him, have fun, go on a plane ride, go, um, and that's it. Yeah. Would you... We used to... We used to have dinner meal every single night before we went to bed. My uh, my daddy always used to help me brush my teeth. Oh. Do you miss him helping brush your teeth? Yes. How do you hope that the world remembers him? Well, they help him because um, those mean people did something to him. Yeah. If you could say anything to your daddy right now, what would it be? It would be, I miss you and I love you. All right. Thank you, Gianna. I really appreciate you answering questions today. That was Gianna Floyd. Your Honor, next we'll hear from the nephew of uh, George Floyd, uh, Brandon Williams. Brandon Williams, B R A N D O N W I L L I A M S. Thank you. You may proceed. On Monday, May twenty fifth, two thousand twenty. George Perry, Floyd, George Perry Floyd Jr. was murdered by Derek Chauvin in a malicious and insidious display of hate and abuse of power. Chauvin killed George. Not only did he kill George, 
but he also displayed a total lack of consideration for human life as he did so. You saw it, I saw it, and millions of people across this country and the globe witnessed the act of hate. A year and one month later, I stand there before you tasked with the duty of expressing how George's death has impacted me personally and the rest of our family. As I racked my brain and thought about what I could say today, I came to this conclusion. It is humanly impossible for me to stand here and convey or articulate the right words that would capture all that we are feeling and what we have felt over this period. So please bear with me as I attempt the impossible. The sudden murder of George has forever traumatized us. You may see us cry, but the full extent of our pain and trauma will never be seen with the naked eye. The heartbreak and hurt goes far beyond any number of tears we could ever cry. Words simply cannot express the pain, anguish, and suffering that our family and friends have endured since George's murder. It has been truly unimaginable. But not as nearly un un unimaginable as the defendant's decision to take the life of a human being with no regard for the effect it may have on others. Although Chauvin will be sentenced today and spend time in prison, he will have the luxury of seeing his family again, talking to him, and he will likely get to spend time with them upon his release. These are all luxuries that my young cousin Gianna were robbed of when Chauvin made the, made the active decision to kill her father. There will be no more birthday parties, no graduations, holiday gatherings, or other family celebrations. The laughter, hugs, guidance, advice, sense of security and those opportunities to simply say I love you are forever gone. They say time heals all, and while I generally believe that saying, it's challenging to do so given these unfathomable set of circumstances. Before I conclude, I must highlight a few things. George's murder, this trial, and everything in between has been tragic and devastating. Our family is forever broken, and one thing we cannot get back is George Floyd. It is the request of my family that the maximum penalty for the crime for which the defendant was convicted be imposed. On behalf of my family, friends, community, and supporters, I wish to express my sincerest gratitude for allowing us opportunities of expression. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Your Honor, first, just for the record, this wonderful lady standing here is a Hennepin County a victim a advocate. Uh, and Bonville uh, is well known to the court. Yes, thank you, Judge. And so, Yana will next uh, hear from the brother of George Floyd, uh, Mr. Terrence Floyd. And Mr. Floyd, if you could state your full name, spelling each of your names. Yes, Terrence Floyd, that's T E R R. E-N-C-E, Floyd, F-L-O-Y-D. Go ahead. I'm here representing my brother. I'm from New York. On May 25th, 2020, my brother was murdered, everyone knows, by Derek Chauvin. The facts of this case were proven beyond a reasonable doubt, and three guilty verdicts were, have been rendered. This situation has really affected me and my family. Any family member that has went through this, we are part of a fraternity of families. And it's not, it's not one of those, you know, fraternities that you enjoy. I just, over this last year and, 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 and months, I actually, Talked to a few people, and um, I wanted to know from the man himself why. 
What were you thinking? What was going through your head when you had your knee on my brother's neck? Why, why, when you, when you knew that he posed no threat anymore, he had, he was handcuffed. Why you didn't at least get up? Why you stayed there? <laughs> A month before my brother was murdered, I was on the phone with him and we had a long conversation. And as I looked at I looked at the video of my niece, the last conversation me and my brother had was he wanted to have play dates. He wanted to plan play dates with Gianna and my daughter. And we we, we started setting it up. That can't happen. And I have to my daughter's still young, but I still have to explain to her because this is history. This, this, this is a case everybody knows about. So she's gonna find out and I'm gonna have to explain that to her. And I, I think that's, to me, harder than even just standing here, that I have to talk to my daughter and tell her, you know, about her niece, about her uncle, about the situation. That's basically reliving it all over again, years down the line. I'm here on behalf of my family, me, on, me, on sorry. Okay, on behalf of me and my family, we seek the maximum penalty we, we don't want to see no more slaps on the wrists. We, we've been through that already. In, this, in my community, in my culture, we've been through that already. Smack on the wrist. No, 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 no. Because if it was us, if it was, the roles was reversed, there wouldn't be no case. It would have been open and shut. We'd have been under the jail for murdering somebody. So we asked for that same penalty for Derek Chauvin. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Your Honor, the final victim impact statement for the state will come from George Floyd's uh, brother, Philonis Floyd. Sir, if you could begin by giving us your full name and spell each of your names, and I have permitted you to use your phone because you have notes on it, is that correct? Yes, sir. All right, and you may proceed when you're ready. Giving us your full name first. Falonis Floyd, uh, spelled P-H-I-L-O-N-I-S-E, last name Floyd, F-L-O-I-D. And you may proceed. One year ago, May 25th, my brother George was murdered by Derek Chauvin and his co-defendants in broad daylight with a knee to his neck for nine minutes and 29 seconds. I was a trucker and immediately my life changed forever. I began to speak to the world for George from the United Nations, Africa, Canada, Japan, and so many other countries. Every day, I have begged for justice to be served, reliving the execution of George, while others begged and pleaded for Officer Chauvin to simply just allow George to take a breath. I haven't had a real nice sleep 
because of the nightmares I constantly have hearing my brother beg and plead for his life over and over again. Even saying, they're going to kill me. Please, officer. Screaming for our mom. I, I have had to sit through each day of Officer Derek Chauvin's trial and watch the video of George dying for hours over and over again. For an entire year, I had to relive George being tortured to death every hour of the day, only taking naps and not knowing what a good night's sleep is anymore. I've been lifting my voice tirelessly every day so that George's death will not be in vain. Honorable Judge Peter Cahill, I thank you for allowing me to share this today. George's life mattered. So my family and I, most of all, my niece, Gianna. My niece, Gianna, she needs closure. I'm asking that you please find it suitable to give Officer Chauvin the maximum sentence possible charge that he has been found guilty for. My family and I have been given a life sentence. We will never be able to get George back. Daddy's our daughter's first love. He will never be able to walk Gianna down the aisle at her wedding, attend those magical moments of her life like a daddy-daughter dance, sweet 16 party, seeing her out for prom graduations, and she will never be able to have any personal memories with her father. With a smirk on his face and children present, Officer Chauvin used excessive force and acted against his training. Chauvin had no regards for human life, George's life. I stand before you today asking you to please help us find closure by giving Chauvin the maximum sentence possible, making sure he does his time consecutively without the possibilities of parole, probation, or getting out early for good behavior. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Frank. Thank you, Your Honor. Here today, of course, for sentencing, gives us an opportunity to speak about, um, you know, other matters that I think are involved in sentencing and where we are in the criminal justice system in the processing of this case. As a, as a member of an elected office representing the people of the state of Minnesota, as well as the people of the local community, I want to say a couple of things. Uh, and first of all, I want to really thank some of the police officers at the Minneapolis Police Department who, under great pressure, great stress, and to some extent at peril to their their occupations, um, what they've devoted their life to, stuck to their oath and their commitment as police officers to speak openly and honestly about policing and the training that is given and received by police officers. Those officers didn't hide behind a blue wall. They came forward, they told this court and those jurors what they knew about training and responsibility. And I think they deserve recognition and credit for that. I would also like to thank members of the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. You know, those agents get called in, a uh, great sacrifice to their personal lives. Whenever things happen, they go. They did that here um, and under really extraordinary circumstances, completed a very professional and thorough investigation. Um, you know, conducting interviews is hard enough, but conducting them in the atmosphere of the city following the murder of George Floyd was even more difficult. And they did so, I think, above and beyond the call of duty 
and I want to thank them for doing that on behalf of the whole prosecution staff. You know, I want to thank the family, the loved ones, the friends of George Floyd. Um, they have been through so much more than families involved in murder cases. He's right. It is a, it is a, it's a fraternity you don't want to be part of. Um, but they've been through so much more because of the pandemic and because of security, safety precautions that we've had to take. They have been through a lot. At a time when they try to grieve, like everybody does for the loss of someone, they are going through so much more. And I want to thank them, all of them, the family. The court saw a testimony from Falonis Floyd, Courtney Ross. These are people who are trying to deal with their loss, but they have to do it in a very public way and under very trying circumstances through no fault of their own. So I thank them. They have all been models of grace and uh, an understanding. And uh, it's really remarkable, quite frankly. I'll, uh, I think, come back to them in a, uh, again in a little bit. Your Honor, we have submitted a sentencing brief. Um, I would incorporate that. I guess I would incorporate my comments today into that memo. But I do think there are things that I want to uh, bring out today in my arguments. For hundreds of years, the court had discretion in sentencing. It was the trial court's decision on what a sentence should be. The recognition that the trial court sat through the trial, watched the evidence, and saw how it affected people, informed the court's discretion. And the legislature passed the guidelines in a legitimate attempt to try and even out sentences um, they defined certain presumptive sentences, as we all know, for typical crimes. For each crime, the typical crime. But they did not remove discretion for sentencing judges. They recognized that nobody is better suited to decide whether this is the typical case represented by that guidelines presumptive sentence, or if there are reasons why this is worse than that. And it gave, and the guideline still gives this court discretion when there are aggravating factors um, to give a more serious sentence than what the guidelines presumption calls for. And as you know, we are asking you to do that today. As this court found, there are four aggravating factors that we have identified that go beyond a list of just what those factors are. We have not just done our homework and found a list. The court made good findings, detailed findings about those factors, and we think they justify uh, a greatly increased sentence. This is not the typical second degree unintentional murder. Supreme Court in our state has said that, you know, very recently, even one aggravating factor is sufficient to go twice the top of the range. Here we have four. The first one that the court found is an abusive position of trust and authority. And the court specifically found that when Mr. Chauvin was acting as a police officer, he had a position of trust and authority. That is certainly true. We trust police officers. We trust them when we need help. We call them for help. We trust that they're going to take care of the problems that they are assigned to deal with, right? We trust them. We also give them great authority. We give them great power. We give them power to use force that individuals would be prosecuted for using, right? We give them authority to um, arrest, to detain. And with great power, of course, comes great responsibility. So they're not sent out there by themselves to do this. They're given substantial training. This court saw all, all of that through the trial in general and in specific to Mr. Chauvin and the other three officers. They're given training on the use of force, the proportional use of force. The force used has to be warranted by the threat. 
They're given training on de-escalation because we recognize that police officers are called in when people are not having their best day, when people might be affected by mental illness, drug abuse, uh, any number of issues. They're just having the, a bad day, and they're trained for that and should be. And they're taught how to use that to de-escalate and control a situation. They're taught medical intervention. They're taught to provide medical attention to people who need it. Being a police officer is a difficult job. We ask a lot of them. It's a profession, there's no doubt about it. But we give them a substantial amount of training and most officers do it right. This case wasn't about police officers, all police officers. It wasn't about policing. This case was about Derek Chauvin disregarding all that training he received and assaulting Mr. Floyd until he suffocated to death. One of the things that uh, you heard, Your Honor, uh, and the jurors heard uh, that can really encapsulate, I think, a big, uh, a very important issue here. Seven words. In your custody is in your care. And it's a real simple mantra. It's a real easy thing to remember. You're going to take custody of somebody. You have to provide care. You have to do it in a caring way. You can't simply disregard their care. Mr. Chauvin abused his position of trust and authority as a police officer by doing just that, just disregarding all his training. It was an abuse of that because what did he decide to do? We often are forced in this you know, criminal justice system to infer people's state of mind by their conduct and their statements. What was Derek Chauvin's end game here? What was the plan? Seems apparent the plan was hold him down until we can dump him in an ambulance and no longer have him be our problem. You recall he said to Charles McMillan, it's a big guy, might be on something. That's it. He held Mr. Floyd down as Mr. Floyd begged for his life. He had the other officers help in that regard. And rather than doing the simple expedient of putting him on his side, he said, yeah, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He was dismissive to that duty of care. We trust that arrestees will be treated with respect, reasonable force, and that their medical needs will be addressed. I'm paraphrasing from the court's findings. That trust was violated. We trust that they will use their authority reasonably. And this was a particularly egregious abuse of that force. Again, paraphrasing the court's findings. The typical second degree murder does not include, does not involve that extent of abuse, of a dearly held uh, position of abuse, or a position of authority and trust by the community by individuals of the community. Your Honor found that Mr. Floyd was treated by, or with, by Mr. Chauvin with particular cruelty. I think tortured is the right word. We know that, I mean, we've all seen it. Mr. Floyd did not want to be in the back seat. That's it. I mean, that's the, that's the rub. It was the need to get him in that back seat no matter what. And we all saw that once he was pulled out of that back seat, he calmed right down, he even willingly went down to the ground. I'm going down, he said. And he went down to the ground, not fighting, not punching. And he was placed initially on his side. He's already handcuffed. He's placed on his side in the recovery position like he should be, because he's trying to breathe, and then quickly placed prone on the ground, face down. Mr. Chauvin put his 
left knee on George Floyd's neck, his right knee on George Floyd's back, face down on the pavement, had Officer King sit on Mr. Floyd's waist area, and had Officer Lane hold his feet down. You can even see Mr. Floyd trying to pull his feet up. We all are gonna fight to breathe. Everybody knows that fear when you all of a sudden realize you're having trouble breathing. It's just innate, right? We wanna survive, we know we have to breathe. And there's an automatic reaction when you begin to feel like that is threatened. And you can see Mr. Floyd going through that. He tries to pull his feet up. But he's held down by these three officers while Officer Tao is looking on. He later, of course, goes to keep the people who want to help away. He's placed face down on this pavement so harshly that it rubs the skin off his face. He has injuries to his face from being face down on the pavement. He has injuries to his knuckles from just trying to, to lift himself up. And he's telling Officer Chauvin, I can't breathe, I'm dying. And Mr. Chauvin's response was, uh-huh. And all this time, I mean, imagine what Mr. Floyd is going through. If you're gonna talk about particular cruelty and torture, really try to appreciate what he's going through. He knows he's suffocating. They don't know that feeling of not being able to breathe enough. And he's begging, he's pleading, and he's being ignored. His concerns are being dismissed by somebody who has taken custody, but not care. He was kept in that prone position for nine and a half minutes and was suffocated. There's no other way to say it. That's particularly cruel. That is more cruel than a typical second degree unintentional murder. Significantly more. This is not a momentary gunshot, punch to the face. This is nine and a half minutes of cruelty to a man who was helpless and just begging for his life. This court found that there were children present, standing only a few feet from these officers. These children who were ages 17 and one child age nine. Why is that an aggravating factor? Well, I think everybody can, can figure that out. Right? It's particularly bad to commit a crime in front of children. We've heard a lot of uh, academia about you know, the development of the young brain and how long it can take. And here you got a couple of teenage girls, a nine-year-old girl. How are they gonna process this? You know, standing feet from a man being suffocated by police officers. Such a stark sight that one of the children even says, we gotta call the police on the police. How do you process that as a nine-year-old? The children were not only present watching a man die. We've all seen, if you haven't, you really need to look at George Floyd's face. As he's dying, he's suffering. The children have to watch this. But not only that, it's police officers, and there are people around them wanting to help. And at one point, and sure, they got upset. And at one point, Mr. Chauvin points his mace grabs his mace to keep him back. How does a child look at that? There's another officer screaming at them to get back. The typical second degree unintentional murder doesn't involve children standing feet away watching a nine and a half minute suffocation of a man begging for his life. This court also made a finding that the uh, defendant committed the offense with the involvement of three or more other persons. Lane and King were involved directly in the restraint and that Tao um, kept the bystanders at bay. I've already talked a little bit about Lane and King's role in holding Mr. Floyd down. They recognized uh, that he was pulseless, that Mr. Floyd was pulseless at one point, and yet really made no effort to take care of the person in their custody. 
Officer Tao watched most of the, the suffocation and then only went over to keep people from giving help. One person who is identified as a medical trained firefighter for the city of Minneapolis, and that was dismissed. Like, pff, are we gonna believe her? So they kept trained medical people from providing help. These were all uniformed peace officers, adding to that abuse of trust and authority. You know, I know the defense has asked the court for probation. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time arguing that. It's so outside of the realm of, I think, real possibility. This is a murder. I understand some of the arguments made on behalf of Mr. Chauvin. I understand, well, no, I can't understand what his family members and friends are going through. I can't. But it's certainly not enough for a departure to probation for a second degree murder. We believe, Your Honor, that these four aggravating factors the court, and the findings that the court has made certainly justify an upward departure because there are four of them, not standing alone, but in a sense, not overlapping, but coming together to show this is not the typical second degree murder. This is egregious. And this justifies a double upward departure. From the top of the box, which is 180 months, we're asking the court to do a double departure, recognizing all four factors to 360 months. As I mentioned before, Your Honor, this is sentencing. This is the time for victims, right? This is the time for the loved ones of the victim and the community to have a say. Again, I, I, I commend this family. I, I, I commend all of the, the loved ones, the friends, the people that have been involved in this case for tolerating and, and being gracious. None of this, of course, can bring George Floyd back. That's very true. But this is the time for our criminal justice system to say, we hear you. This is the time for their criminal justice system to say, we recognize that this harm you're going through is real. And while we can't feel what you're feeling, we know we can do what the, your criminal justice system should do and recognize the severity of this crime and reflect that in the sentence to be given. It's time for this criminal justice system to say, we recognize this is more serious than the typical second degree unintentional murder. The four reasons the court found reflect that and give this court more than an adequate basis to do that. Your Honor, we ask the court to impose a sentence of 360 months, commitment to the Commissioner of Corrections. As you know, Your Honor, there are no fines in murder cases. And we would ask the court uh, just to reserve the issue of, restit of restitution. So we can clarify that with the family and present that to the court um, for 30 days. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. Anything further from the state? No, Your Honor. Okay. Mr. Nelson. I'm sorry. Mr. Blackwell. I'm sorry, Your Honor. Just, um, Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, at this time, uh, the defendant's mother, Carolyn Palenti, would like to address the court. Right. If you could uh, state your full name, spelling each of your names, and proceed when you're ready. Yes. Carolyn, C A R. We are hearing right now the mother of Palenti, former officer Derek Chauvin speaking right now. This is the first time we've heard from her speaking on behalf of her son in the defense. Let's listen. I am the mother of. Derek Schollen. I am here to speak on behalf of my entire family. On November 25th, 2020, not only did Derek's life change forever, but so did mine and my family's. 
Derek devoted 19 years of his life to the Minneapolis Police Department. It has been difficult for me to hear and read what the media, public, and prosecution team believe Derek to be an aggressive, heartless, and uncaring person. I can tell you that is far from the truth. My son's identity has also been reduced to that as of that as a racist. I want this court to know that none of these things are true and that my son is a good man. Derek always dedicated his life and time to the police department. Even on his days off, he would call in to see if they needed help. Derek is a quiet, thoughtful, honorable, and self, selfless man. He has a big heart, and he always has put others before his own. The public will never know the loving and caring man he is, but his family does. Even though I have not spoken publicly, I have always supported him 100% and always will. Derek has played over and over in his head the events of that day. I have seen the toll it has taken on him. I believe a lengthy sentence will not serve Derek well. When you sentence my son, you will also be sentencing me. I will not be able to see Derek, talk to him on the phone, or give him our special hug. Plus the fact that when he is released, his father and I most likely will not be here. Derek. My happiest moment is when I gave birth to you. And my second is when I was honored to pin your police badge on you. I remember you whispering to me, don't stick me with it. Derek, I want you to know I have always believed in your innocence and I will never waver from that. I have read numerous letters from people around the world that also believe in your innocence. No matter where you go, where you are, I will always be there to visit you. I promise you I will stay strong, as we talked about, and I want you to do the same for me. I will do what you told me to do, take care of myself. So I will be here for you when you come home. Remember there is no stronger bond or love than a mother's love. And one final thought I want you to remember, remember you are my favorite son. Thank you for your time. Mm -hmm. Mr. Nelson. Thank you very much, Your Honor. Uh, it is my intent that my remarks this afternoon be quite brief. 
I do not intend to relitigate the facts of this case, nor spend any substantial time uh, looking at the law. The court is very familiar with the facts of this case, and the parties have fully briefed uh, the court relevant to the sentencing factors. And we recognize that in any case, any sentencing that comes before the court, the court is tasked with a difficult job. The court must craft a sentence that serves the interests of justice, a rather nebulous term. The court must take into consideration the victim impact, public interests, as well as the circumstances and the history of the defendant. And in this case, more than any other, that likely any of us have ever been involved in, that task is exceedingly more difficult. In my remarks today, I just wish to briefly address each of those three considerations, starting with the public impact. As I believe we are all cognizant of, this case is at the epicenter of a cultural and political divide. We tried to keep a lot of that out of the courtroom during the trial and make this case about the facts. But we recognize uh, what has happened as a result of this case. There are a great number of people who will view any sentence you pronounce as overly lenient and insufficient to satisfy justice. But there are an equal number of people who will view any sentence you pronounce as draconian or overbearing. Either way, some percentage of the public will view your sentence as a miscarriage of justice. The intensity of the public interest in this case cannot be understated. I trust that the volume of correspondence that each of us has received from the public at large is indicative of these very sentiments on both sides. As I was informed just yesterday, the Attorney General's office established a website, some web submission, to accept community impact statements. Again, in my understanding is in a little over two weeks, they received over a thousand submissions. Again, on both sides. By my very best estimate, since my representation of Mr. Chauvin began last summer, I would estimate that I have received over 5,000 emails over a thousand voicemails and hundreds and hundreds of handwritten letters. Again, from both sides. And I expect that your honor has likewise been inundated with public comment and scrutiny. The impact that this case has had on this community is profound. It goes far beyond what happened on May 25th of last year. It has been at the forefront of our national consciousness, and it has weaved its way into every, nearly every facet of our lives, from the entertainment that we consume to the presidential politics, from protests to conspiracy theories. In the end, it is my sincere hope that when this proverbial dust settles, the community, act, uh, the community impact brings forth principled debate and civil public discourse and ultimately leaves a, public, a positive effect on the city of Minneapolis, the state of Minnesota, and the United States. But nevertheless, while this court may consider the community impact, it is for these very same reasons that the court must turn to the foundational legal principles and remember that justice is blind. Law is built on reason and common sense, and it cannot be permitted to be assailed by public opinion. Turning to the second consideration, which is the victim impact, the death of George Floyd. The death of George Floyd was tragic. He is loved by his family members. He is loved by his friends and his death is justifiably mourned 
by those whose lives he impacted. He is a son, a brother, a father, an uncle, and a friend to many. And as the court heard today, the impact and the loss of his life, of the loss of his life, simply just, it can't be simplified. And it will take time. Finally, Your Honor, the court must take into consideration, just like it has to take into consideration the aggravating factors, it needs to take into consideration the mitigating factors. And the mitigating factors as set forth by the sentencing guidelines really point to the TROG analysis, essentially, ultimately, in this case. I'm not going to spend a lot of time, again, arguing for a probationary sentence that's briefed. But that being said, when we look at the TROG factors, who is Derek Chauvin? Derek Chauvin spent 19 years as a Minneapolis police officer. He loved being a police officer. I was contacted during the course of my representation and have had numerous uh, conversations with his fellow police officers or fellow police officers that worked with Derek, some retired, some still active. And they told me that he was a solid police officer, that he did his job, that if somebody asked him to do a particular task, he never complained, he did it. One person told me that if one of his sergeants told me that if I had asked him to dig a ditch for eight hours, he would have picked up a shovel and he would have never complained for a second. He would have done his job. He was decorated as a police officer. Multiple life-saving awards. He was decorated for valor. He was proud to be a police officer because what he liked to do was help people. And as the statistics show the vast majority of police work is helping people. He was proud to be a Minneapolis police officer. He served his country as the United States in the United States Army. And he too is a son and a brother and a father and a friend. He too, his life the life he's lived, he's not coming into this as a career criminal with six points, five points, four points. He's coming into this never having violated the law because he lived an honorable life and he attempted to live an honorable life. Derek Chauvin was not even scheduled to work on May 25th, 2020. He volunteered because there was short staffing at the time. I know from numerous conversations that I've had with Derek that his brain is littered with what ifs. What if I just had not agreed to go in that day? What if things had gone differently? What if I never responded to that call? What if, what if, what if? The truth of the matter is, and the end result is, is that we are here after a jury verdict, finding him guilty of these offenses. And the court's consideration should not only be focused on the aggravating factors, but the mitigating factors as well. The Minnesota Sentencing Guidelines Commission was established for a reason. And yes, the court in circumstances like these has discretion to go beyond and aggravate a sentence beyond the presumptive sentences established by the sentencing guidelines. But the sentencing guidelines don't differentiate between second degree murders. Someone robs a liquor store, a police officer is involved in an incident, and a person dies in police custody. The law presumes, the legislature presumes that the the sentencing guidelines as established is a su sufficient penalty for all of the second degree murder categories or cases you would see. From 2019 back to 2010, a total of 90 people were sentenced for second degree murder. Those sentences, those people, there were more than that, 
of people who had a zero criminal history score. More than 90 people were sentenced. 67% or 60 of those 90 people received a guideline sentence of 150 months. So two thirds of all people in this same position received a guideline sentence. 20% received an aggravated sentence, 18 of the 90. And 12, or excuse me, 13% or 12 individuals were granted mitigated departures. So if the legislature and the intent of the sentencing guidelines is to eliminate sentencing disparity, the law should presume that the guideline sentence is what is appropriate in this case. Judge may take, you may take into consideration at this point those aggravating factors, but you have to counterbalance them, which is the goal of the law with the mitigating factors. I know that this has been an incredibly difficult case for the Floyd family to have to endure. The state of Minnesota, uh, likewise, the prosecutors in this case have endured quite a bit, as has Mr. Chauvin's family. This is a case that has changed, has changed the world to some degree, and I hope it's positive. But it's my hope that the court follows the sentencing guidelines, applies the law in a reasoned manner, and imposes a just sentence. Thank you, Mr. Chauvin. Would you join Mr. Nelson at the lectern? Uh, Mr. Chauvin, th this is your opportunity if you wish to uh, give any input to the court. And so I turn it over to you and your attorney. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, at this time, due to some additional legal matters at hand. I'm not able to give a full formal statement at this time. Um, but very briefly though, I uh, do want to give my condolences to the Floyd family. Um, there's going to be some other information in the future that would be of interest. And uh, I hope things will give you some, some peace of mind. Thank you. And I'll note that I did read your comments in the pre-sentence investigation as well. Thanks, Ron. All right, we are going to take a 15 minute recess so that I can complete the sentencing order based on what I've heard today. And let's reconvene at 2.45. We're in recess. And there you hear a Judge Cahill ordering a 15 minute recess right now. This is the sentencing of former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin. And it has been emotional and powerful already out of the gates. We did see Derek Chauvin himself for the first time remove his mask in the courtroom and say a few words. He said that he couldn't speak too much because of some additional legal matters that are still ahead. He wasn't able to give a full formal statement, but he did say he turned back into the courtroom and addressed the Floyd family directly for the first time and said, I want to give my condolences to the Floyd family. And he also said, and this was interesting, um, and we, we didn't quite know what to make of this. Um, there's going to be additional information that I think will be of interest to you. Uh, we also heard from Derek Chauvin's mother, and that was another surprise. We were not expecting to hear from her, Carolyn Pawlenty, and she said that Chauvin has played these events over and over in his head multiple times. She's seen the toll that it's taken on him. When you sentence my son, you will also be sentencing me. She also said that I want you to know, speaking to her son, that I've always believed in your innocence. Of course, emotional testimony from the Floyd family as well. We saw a, a heartfelt message from his seven-year-old daughter, Gianna, who says that she misses her dad and she loves him um, and that she thinks about him and that somebody hurt her daddy. And we also heard from his brothers who were choking back tears trying to get through their testimony at this sentencing as well. There's a lot to unpack here, but during this break, I want to go around the horn here and talk to the people we have. We have our senior national affairs correspondent, Deborah Roberts, here. And wow, a few surprises already. You were talking to people about this case, getting a ton of reaction from Chauvin's mom, and then he himself 
removed his mask and spoke. That's right, Whit. And I have to say, it was, it was a stunning moment to hear from his mother. I think so many people were waiting to hear some words of maybe either condolence or maybe some heartfelt words of a remorse on the part of her son. And he, this hasn't gone unnoticed on social media. So many people feeling sort of outraged, if you will, that, um, that she didn't really acknowledge George Floyd's death. And I think for a lot of people in, of color in this community, it sort of speaks to that feeling of just being ignored. You heard George Floyd's family talk about his life mattered. And you didn't hear that in her comments. And I, I think that uh, that struck a lot of people. His attorney actually did reference his death a minute ago. But I think for a lot of people, that was a very stunning moment. And I think that speaks to what so many people have been feeling in this country, particularly people of color, about a life mattering. It's not about a black life only mattering, but a black life matters too. And I think that's what people were probably really struck by when they heard her speak about her son. And we heard. Uh, George Floyd's brother, of uh, Flonis Floyd, speaking directly to Chauvin, essentially pleading with him, you know, I want to hear from you. Tell me why you did what you did. I, I wonder what the Floyd family is thinking about what they heard from Chauvin himself. And that last little bit, it was interesting. He looked at them, he expressed his condolences, but then said that there might be more information in the future that would be of interest to you. Yeah, very cryptic comments. I cannot imagine that that gave them any source of mm. comfort. I can't imagine anything that was said, even by his attorney, when he acknowledged George Floyd's death, that that brought any comfort. I haven't heard from anybody, and I've spoken to a few people over the last few days. I haven't heard from anybody who really necessarily wanted to hear from Derek Chauvin. I don't think anybody expected that they would hear anything. But I can imagine that a lot of people wanted to know something from that family when they heard from his mother, something that kind of acknowledged George Floyd's death and suffering and the loss that his family so poignantly sort of pointed out. And you certainly didn't hear that from his side today. And you described after the conviction and the trial, for, for many it was a sigh of relief when, when that conviction came through. And now a lot of people across the country are holding their breath to see what happens in the sentencing here. I uh, want to bring in some others to discuss as well. Let, let's get to Dan Abrams, our chief legal analyst. And Dan, as I come to you, I just want to point out these four aggravating factors because there's been so much discussed about this. And I believe we have a graphic to give some explanation. Remember, he was convicted on three counts here. But the most serious charge, second degree murder, that is what the judge is considering. But in addition, you have these four aggravating factors. Uh, they're up on the screen there, abuse, position of power and authority, particular cruelty, presence of children. There were people under the age of 18 who witnessed this killing and committed a crime with the active participation of others. And those, of course, the other officers involved. Uh, but Dan, my question to you is the defense attorney there, Mr. Nelson, said that it's not just the aggravating factors, but also the mitigating factors. What did you make of the case they were making? Well, first of all, we have to remember the judge has ruled on the question of the aggravating factors, meaning the prosecutors came to the judge and said, we believe that this sentence should be above the typical range because of these aggravating factors. They actually argued five. The judge accepted four. So right there, that tells you that the judge is very sympathetic to the prosecution's argument. He's saying, yes, these are aggravating factors. Yes, I am going to take these into account. But there is no specific formula for how many years each one of the aggravating factors necessarily gets. You're right. Um, the defense attorney, uh, Mr. Nelson, referred to potential mitigating factors. I think the sort of the strongest argument he has is a statistical one, right, to say of the people who have been convicted of this crime with no criminal background, uh, this is how few have gotten uh, a higher sentence. Problem is that the judge has already ruled that they're aggravating factors, therefore saying this case is different. It's not just like every other case involving second degree unintentional murder. And so as we talked about earlier, I expect that the judge is going to go over the 10 to 15 year range. The question is just going to be how far above it does he go? Uh, let's bring in Sonny Hostin as well, ABC News legal analyst, former prosecutor, also co-host of The View. Sonny, it's good to have you with us. I, I want to get your response to what Dan said there, but also one of the big questions coming into this is would Derek Chauvin himself speak? We heard him speak. He admitted that it would have to be limited in what he said, but did his words help his case in any way today? 
Uh, I don't believe so. And, and I will tell you, you know, the, the lawyers, uh, of course, in the courtroom, I, I think made the appropriate legal arguments that we expected to hear. The judge, as Dan mentioned, had already um, made his determination as to the aggravating factors here. And judges most often times have already made a determination as to what the sentence will be. The factor that is really most important in my experience with is these victim impact statements. And I've been in courtrooms many, many, many times trying my own cases, and I never know how these victim impact statements go. The victim impact statements presented by the Floyd family went as well as they could possibly go. You have Gianna Floyd, a seven-year-old who has lost her father to cruelty, to suffocation, to murder on video, nine and a half minutes, saying that she missed her father, that he used to brush her teeth nightly with her. She wanted to play with him, that he was there in spirit, noting that he was a present, loving father. That was very important. Each brother, nephew, they all said, we want the maximum sentence. This is a hole in our family. I think Felonius in particular said, my family got a death, uh, a, a life sentence here. On the flip side of this, we didn't hear any colleagues of Derek Chauvin, no police officers that he has worked with throughout his career saying, don't judge him by these nine and a half minutes. He is my friend. He is my colleague. He is my co, uh, you know, former officer colleague. We didn't hear from any siblings. We didn't hear from any clergymen. We didn't hear from anyone except for his mother, and I will say this, his mother did him no favors. She offered no condolences to the Floyd family. She professed his innocence to a murder that we all saw, all saw worldwide on video. She also said some things that I found particularly um, callous, in, in fact. She called him honorable, she called him selfless. She said that a lengthy sentence would be sentencing her. She also said that he was a good man. Well, I think the response would be a good man doesn't kill someone, doesn't murder someone that he knew, that he knew. And, and so when you look at the victim impact statements here, I don't think that the judge will, uh, Judge Cahill, will change in, in any way the sentence that he went into this hearing uh, thinking about imposing. And we know that the Floyd family, we heard it repeatedly at the sentencing, that they want the maximum sentence available. Going back to Flonus Floyd there, he also said that my family and I have been given a life sentence. We will never be able to get George back. I do want to bring in our Alex Perez. He is in Minneapolis outside the courtroom. Alex, you've been on this story since the very beginning, from the incident itself to the protests to the trial. Just want to get your take on, on the mood and tone around the courtroom and, and leading up to today. Yeah, well, 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 you know, the family has been saying from day one when this incident began that they want to make sure that George Floyd's life, his death, was not in vain. They want to know why this happened. That question about why, we heard Felonius ask it in court during his victim impact statement, and they didn't get an answer. Even though we heard from Derek Chauvin for the first time, we heard from Derek Chauvin's mother, they never address that question. Why couldn't you get up? Why didn't you let him take a breath? And I have to reiterate what some of our colleagues there have been saying. It's been noted by everyone. Uh, uh, Chauvin's mother's statement. There were no condolences to the Floyd family. Uh, there was no expression of remorse during those comments that she made. And then when we saw Derek Chauvin stand up and talk for the first time, um, he extended his condolences, but there wasn't a clear sense of remorse about what had happened. Uh, with, and also in the courtroom, we learned a couple of things that we did not know uh, over the last year. We learned that Derek Chauvin, uh, according to his attorney in court, was not actually scheduled to work that day. That he called in and there was, they were uh, a short staff and that's why he decided uh, to come in and, and be on the job that day. And as we all know, that was the day that George Floyd lost his life. Now, uh, one thing we have to point out here, Whit, is just how un unusual it is that we are talking about this. Police officers are not often prosecuted and very rarely are they convicted. Only uh, nine police officers in the last 16 years have been sentenced to prison time for killing someone on the job. Uh, Derek Chauvin here will be the 10th 
to do that. Now, uh, we, we expect that the judge here, Peter Cahill, who's known as a moderate sentencer, uh, is really taking all of these factors into consideration. As Sonny said, there's a chance that uh, perhaps he's already made up his decision, but we saw him in court there listening very intently to all of those victim impact statements, listening uh, uh, to the prosecutor, Matthew Frank, uh, who repeated over and over uh, those words, uh, the seven words that police officers are supposed to remember when they're dealing with someone in your custody and in your care. And the prosecutor, Matthew Frank, saying clearly that Derek Chauvin violated that mantra. Prosecutors asking for 30 years behind bars. Uh, we'll see what he's going to decide uh, in just a few minutes. Wait. Absolutely. Alex, thank uh, to you. We want to go to our uh, chief justice correspondent, Pierre Thomas. And Pierre, I just want to pick up on what Alex was saying there, expressing just how rare it is to see a police officer there convicted of murder. And here we are now at the sentencing. And there's been this year of racial reckoning, protests, renewed calls for police reform, justice reform. Your take on what we heard today and really what has changed in this country since the death of George Floyd? When it is exceedingly rare to have a police officer uh, convicted and sentenced in uh, the way that we expect to see in a few moments. Uh, law enforcement officials have been watching this case so intently. And I have to tell you, I've spoken to a number of law enforcement officials and not a one uh, supported Derek Chauvin in the way that he acted. They all talked about the callous nature in which uh, George Floyd was killed, the way that uh, Chauvin had his knee on the back of George Floyd's neck, uh, killing him as casually as, it, as if he was reading a Sunday newspaper, uh, one official talked to me about. So they know that this case has had enormous implications for the issue of policing and on the issue of whether black people are treated fairly by the criminal justice system. Uh, law enforcement officials have been struck by the notion of this question of black people being treated as suspects first and citizens second. And one of the things we know is that in the broader community, the white community, some attitudes have changed. Uh, in 2014, roughly 44 percent of white Americans thought that black people were treated unfairly by the criminal justice system. By last summer, that number had jumped to 62 percent. So attitudes have changed in this country. Also, we know that uh, law enforcement officials now are facing changes uh, in the states. 17 states now bar uh, chokeholds and those kind of tactics uh, by police. So we have seen some change. But at the end of the day, this is a challenging issue with uh, we had a person of color killed in that community within days of the uh, conviction of uh, Mr. Uh, Chauvin. Uh, there will undoubtedly be more. And now the question is, how will the country continue to move forward, especially at a moment when crime is rising and police are needed more than ever? And to your point, Pierre, Matthew Frank, the assistant attorney general of Minnesota, uh, made a point. He said it this way. He said, this is the time for a criminal justice system to say, we hear you. Uh, and uh, a, a lot of people are paying close attention to those words. I want to bring in our Terry Moran as well, our senior national correspondent. And Terry, you've been following all this. Uh, give us a big picture here because this was not just one incident of police brutality. This was not just one bad apple police officer. This, this sparked this moment of racial reckoning, these protests across the country, but also a national moment of looking inward and reflection. It sure did. And we heard that in this sentencing proceeding, <clears throat> excuse me, just once, when Derek Chauvin's lawyer, Eric Nelson, said this case is at the epicenter of a cultural and political divide. Now, no man should be sentenced because he's the symbol of something like that. But today, uh, preparing for this sentencing hearing, I, I, I was put in mind of Emmett Till, uh, who my mom told me and her other nine children about. Uh, the young man, boy, really, in who was from Chicago, killed in Mississippi. I, I was thinking of Fred Hampton, the Black Panther leader in Chicago, who, when I was a boy, I remember reading and, and hearing in riveting detail the, his police murder. And, and you can't help but think that's why we're here. That's why 2020 turned out the way it did is because our country has a history of violence against black bodies uh, committed with impunity. And after this video taken by young Darnella Frazier went viral across the world, the country rose up in large numbers. I actually think Eric Nelson did the country a disservice when he said, well, half will think this sentence is too draconian and half will think uh, it's not enough. I don't think it's 50-50 on this. 
You look at who was in the streets last year. Uh, primarily young people because it's young people we depend upon uh, to push the world uh, uh, forward. But there's no question they were from all different kinds of backgrounds, all different kinds of ages. The country rose up because our history here is in that courtroom. Uh, and that's not something, once again, that the judge can sentence for. But there is something about trials that speak about our community. And he does, as a judge, as a good judge, understand that that will be part of his sentence. You mentioned Fred Thompson, Emmett Till, the big difference now, it was on video and social media and the entire country and the entire world watched what happened. Uh, we are waiting right now for Judge Peter Cahill uh, to bring the court back in session. Once again, this is the sentencing of former Minneapolis police officer, Derek Chauvin, powerful emotional moments so far. Uh, there you see it inside the courtroom should come back in any minute minute here. Uh, let's see. Do we have time to, for one more? Uh, let's go ahead and, and check back in with, with Deborah Roberts. Here. You've, you've been following this, listening to what everybody's been saying. I know I've been seeing you on your phone communicating with people. What are some of the people you're talking to? Uh, how are they reacting to what they've heard so far? I think for a lot of people, with the, the, it's not a big surprise. I mean, I think people sort of expected, as Sonny said, you would hear the impact statements. Of course, people were touched by the Floyd family saying, you know, their lives had been irreparably changed by this. But I think more than anything else, what I'm hearing from people is, whatever happens, whatever sentence the judge gives here, Judge Cahill gives here, for a lot of people, it doesn't really change a lot because, you know, there are statistics that show that black Americans are three times more likely to be killed at the hands of police than white Americans. Um, as you've heard some of those other statistics about people who have been, you know, even since the Floyd verdict, people who have been killed at the hands of police. So I think for a lot of people, there's sort of this resignation. Yes, they feel relieved that this is finally a case that shows some accountability. But yet there's still, I think, a resignation that a lot still has to, to be worked on, that there's still got to be some reform. And a lot of folks are saying things like, you know, this is, yes, finally a relief, but it doesn't really completely change the system yet when you look at a lot of these cases. I mean, even just one week before George Floyd, uh, the case of George Floyd and Chauvin was uh, found guilty, Dante Wright uh, was killed in Minneapolis. So there's still cases out there where, you know, people have been harmed at the hands of police and there has not been accountability. Yes, people are calling for maximum, and you see that a lot on social uh, media, but I don't really know that that's going to be a cure and, and, and it's sort of a, going to you know, sort of satisfy people in the way that maybe you hope it will. And, and you touched on this. We've seen a lot of reactions so far to Derek Chauvin's mother, Carolyn Palenti, and we actually have a video of that moment when she was speaking, and this is the close-up on Chauvin. And during the trial, people noted that he didn't respond emotionally very much. Um, but we did see, as his mother was speaking, the, those tearful moments on her behalf. We saw him close his eyes for a period of time. Um, but very mixed reaction uh, from people on what she said, the substance of what she said. And many accusing her and Derek Chauvin himself having more remorse for you know, her son than for the Floyd family. Um, that's what we've been hearing from a lot of people. You're certainly hearing that a lot on social media, and I'm sure we'll hear more about that later tonight. I think Sonny was absolutely right, though. I don't think she did her son any favors. I think when we saw her step up to that podium, and we know never heard her speak publicly before, we expected that we would hear something that would give us a little bit of humanity, a little window into her son. And she talked about his life and the fact that she would be hurt and harmed, but we never heard her acknowledge the Floyd family. And I think that was really, really shocking and mm -hmm. saddening. It's a, it's a difficult uh, day in the courtroom there, and there have already been a number of surprises. Again, we're still awaiting Judge Peter Cahill to call the court back into session. But just to remind people about where we are and where we stand right now, Derek Chauvin, once again, convicted on three separate charges, but because of the laws in the state, he right now, uh, the most, the primary charge that is of consideration is the second degree murder charge, because that is the highest charge of the three. And then you have the four aggravating factors. If we have that graphic, you can put that up, because there's been a lot of discussion about this. Those four aggregating factors will play into what the judge ultimately decides in terms of the sentence there. And we heard that the prosecution talking repeatedly about what all of this meant and how this could play into his ultimate sentence. And let's bring Dan Abrams back into this because there are these factors uh, in terms of what the sentence could ultimately be. But, Dan, there is a wide range. We're talking 15 to 40 years. And the defense says probation and credit for time served. How likely is that? 
Well, I think even the defense attorney was recognizing that parole uh, probation isn't happening, right? It's why he doesn't even want to argue it at this point, because it's a non-issue. Uh, so we know that the sentencing range is 10 to 15 years. We know that the judge has said, yes, there are aggravating factors. We know the prosecutors are asking for 30 years, and we know the max is 40 years. So you're talking about somewhere in the range of 15 to 40 years. Um, I think that the, the most likely scenario, sort of taking it out of the, the sort of broader implications of this case, would be to presume that the judge is going to, to take the Dan, guidelines me. We're gonna, of the 15 Sorry to cut you off. We're going to go back to Judge Peter Cahill. Court is well, back in session. All, I wanted to thank everybody for being here and for providing the input you did. Not just the people who are in the courtroom here, but also those who provided written statements, uh, both from the Floyd family and the defendant's family. I've read all the impact statements that were submitted earlier and listen carefully to all the input here today. And it is truly appreciated that you took the time to stay with this case and to provide me with input. I have reviewed the pre-sentence investigation and carefully considered all the facts of the case and the law. But my comments are actually going to be very brief because most of it's going to be in writing. I have a 22-page memorandum that is going to be attached to the sentencing order. And why am I doing it in writing? To emphasize the fact that determining the appropriate sentence in any case, and in this case, is a legal analysis. It's applying the rule of law to the facts of an individual and specific case. And that is why, as opposed to trying to be being profound here on the record, I prefer that you read the legal analysis that explains how I determine the sentence in this case. What the case is, or what the sentence is not based on is emotion or sympathy. But at the same time, I want to acknowledge the deep and tremendous pain that all the families are feeling, especially the Floyd family. You have our sympathies. And I acknowledge and hear the pain that you are feeling. I acknowledge the pain not only of those in this courtroom, but the Floyd family who are outside this courtroom and other members of the community. It has been painful throughout Hennepin County, throughout the state of Minnesota, and even the country. But most importantly, we need to recognize the pain of the Floyd family. I'm not going to attempt to be profound or clever because it's not the appropriate time. I'm not basing my sentence also on public opinion. I'm not basing it on any attempt to send any messages. A trial court judge, the job of a trial court judge, is to apply the law to specific facts and to deal with individual cases. And so, Mr. Chauvin, as to count one, based on the verdict of the jury, finding you guilty of unintentional second degree murder while committing a felony under Minnesota Statute 609.19 subdivision 2 paren 1, it is the judgment of the court that you now stand convicted of that offense. Pursuant to Minnesota Statute uh, Section 60904, Counts 2 and 3 will remain unadjudicated as they are lesser offenses of Count 1. As a sentence for Count 1, the court commits you to the custody of the Commissioner of Corrections for a period of 270 months. That's 270. That is a 10-year addition to the presumptive sentence of 150 months. This is based on your uh, abuse of a position of trust and authority and also the particular cruelty shown to George Floyd. You are granted credit for 199 days already served. Pay the mandatory surcharge of $78 to be paid from prison wages. You are prohibited from possessing firearms, ammunition, or explosives for the remainder of your life. Provide a DNA sample as required by law 
register as a predatory offender as required by law, and then you will receive a copy of the order and also the attached memorandum explaining the court's analysis. Anything further from the state? If this needs to be decided, we just ask that it be executed forthwith. Defendant is remanded to the custody of the sheriff to be transported uh, back to the DOC or whichever custody is currently holding him. Anything for the defense? No, you are. All right. Thank you. We are adjourned. And there you have it, the sentence passed down from Judge Peter Cahill. He said that his words would be brief, and they were. 22 and a half years when you add up the months that he just mentioned there. That is the sentence for Derek Chauvin for killing George Floyd on that day last year in Minneapolis. Let's get right back to Deb Roberts, who's uh, with us in the studio. You've been hearing from people about their expectations. People said they wanted a stiff penalty. Uh, folks you were talking to, what do you think they're going to react to with this? Well, we heard the Floyd family asking for maximum. We've heard people, uh, you know, on social media. I've talked to people who've said they thought the punishment should fit the crime. You know, listen, as Dan Harris said, it wasn't the 15 years, but it certainly wasn't the max of 40 years. Um, I can imagine that some people will be disappointed. But again, you have to remember, this is a police officer who was convicted of, uh, of killing a man, a black man in America. It doesn't happen very often. Often. Um, the numbers are very small, less than 2% are ever convicted. So I would imagine for a lot of people there is still some satisfaction that there was actually accountability because at the end of the day, with that is what you hear so often from people that rarely, rarely is there accountability. And there certainly was in this case. Um, it certainly wasn't a slap on the wrist, as I would imagine many people, you know, will, will definitely attest to. Uh, wasn't the maximum, but he certainly got a very hefty sentence for what we all witnessed, this traumatic killing of a man and maybe for some people maybe for some it restores some faith that there can be justice still a lot of cases out there that haven't been decided but there is justice at least some measure of justice in this case and i would imagine we're going to hear that from a number of people today i want to go back to alex perez who's been following this case from the beginning he's there in minneapolis outside the courtroom alex you have spoken with the floyd family on a number of occasions um, I don't know if not very much time has passed so far, but what do you make of the sentence 22 and a half years and, and what you expect their reaction would be? Well, Whit, I can tell you the family wanted the maximum sentence, and we all sort of knew going into this that the judge would probably land somewhere in the middle of that. The family says they did not want the minimum sentence, and they did not get that. But to them, ultimately, uh, this is about bringing justice for George Floyd and also making sure that his death was not in vain. I remember interviewing Terrence Floyd, and he said he will continue to talk about his brother every day until change happens here in America and across the world. And I think this sentence handed down by the judge today uh, shows that this was much more than just a slap in a on the wrist. 22 and a half years for this murder, which was captured on uh, on video there. With. So uh, the family, I'm sure, is uh, receiving this with mixed emotions right now. But I can tell you just in talking to people on the streets over the last year, they wanted to see this through from the very beginning, from the first time they saw that video up into this point, the sentencing. And many people are already now starting to talk about the trial of the other other three officers, former officers, which will happen next year. So uh, th this is one step in, in, in a bigger step process. Um, but in talking to people in the street uh, with uh, protesters who of all backgrounds who have come together, because you have to remember this case, uh, despite uh, the sentencing today, has already changed America in many, many ways. People of all backgrounds have come together for a common cause. And we've seen that across the country over the last year and one month. And so uh, seeing this sentence, recognizing that what this police officer did was wrong and sentencing him to 22 and a half years, this is what a lot of people have been asking for, just uh, this recognition that police officers do not always do the right thing and that black people, particularly here in America, often, often have to deal uh, with situations like this and are not, the justice does not come to them the way it does to other groups. Now, we also heard uh, the judge in court talk about there how his decision was not based on public opinion. But we all know how the criminal justice system here works in America. It's not just uh, to punish those who violate the law, but it's also about deterrence, to make sure things like this don't happen again, or if, if it's gonna happen again, we know that you will be punished 
punished for it. And I think we're seeing that in the courtroom here, the judge spending a lot of time talking, recognizing this moment here in Minneapolis, in Minnesota, but really across the country. Everyone was impacted by this, and the judge wanted to make sure that everyone heard that. Wit. All right, Alex Perez for us. Thank you so much. Yeah, the judge saying that he didn't want the sentence. It was not based on emotion or sympathy. It was a, a legal definition that he needed to give, given the crime. Let's go back to um, Dan Abrams. Dan, I, I, forgive me, I had to cut you off before as we brought the judge back in. Those aggravating factors you were discussing, they turned out to be factors in this sentence. Yeah, and, and I think it's important to remember when thinking about the sentence that he's starting from the 10 to 15 year range, right? I mean, this is not a first degree murder case. This is a second degree murder case. This is a second degree unintentional murder case. And as far as that goes in the state of Minnesota, this is a stiff sentence. Now, some people are gonna say it's not stiff enough, it should have been higher, et cetera. But it is clear that the judge took those aggravating factors into account. It's also clear, by the way, that he'd written the opinion before we heard from the impact statements, right? You don't go back and write a 22 page opinion in a matter of moments. So, so it, it is clear that he knew what he was going to do, that he was assessing this as a, what he views as a legal matter, taking into account uh, the sentencing guidelines, adding the aggravating factors onto that, and interestingly, telling the court uh, that he doesn't want to speak too much about this. He wants his words in the actual opinion uh, to, speak, uh, to speak louder than what he says in court. Dan, thank you. I just got something right in front of me here. This is a response from attorney Ben Crump, who's been representing the Floyd family here. Uh, and again, the Floyd family was asking for the maximum sentence. He tweeted here, 22 and a half years. This historic sentence brings the Floyd family and our nation one step closer to healing by delivering closure and accountability. So that, again, from one of the attorneys representing the Floyd family. Let's go back to Sonny Hostin here. Uh, we heard the family asking for the maximum sentence. They didn't quite get it, but 22 and a half years, significant, and in Crump's words, historic. It is historic. It is significant. Uh, I have never seen this kind of sentence when it comes to uh, accountability in, in terms of police violence. And in looking, um, I'm looking at my notes. I mean, we're talking about second degree unintentional murder. And while that is uh, not an intent crime, it's an unintentional murder. It's without intent to cause death. But let's remember, it is with the intent to inflict bodily harm. And so we saw that infliction of bodily harm on video for nine and a half minutes and the judge took that into consideration he also took in into consideration the fact that he was in this position of authority as a police officer and the particular cruelty that we all all saw and, and so i will say because of the cruelty of it all um i think this was uh, you know an unusual upward departure which is what we, we call it in uh, legal parlance and that is a significant upward departure from 10 to 15 years to 22 and a half. He is, I believe, 45 years old. If he serves that entire sentence, he would uh, not get out until he is 67 years old. If he serves about 15 years, which is the norm, uh, he would be about 60. He's also facing federal charges. Let's remember that. And let's also remember that being in prison as a former police officer is very difficult. He will probably spend a lot of time uh, in solitary confinement. So not an easy 22 years to serve either. Oh, Sonny, thank you. We are just looking at a live picture here. Just wanted to point out this is in Minneapolis, uh, the memorial there, the makeshift memorial for George Floyd. No doubt the word about this sentence is starting to spread quickly on social media. We can see more people uh, showing up at the scene. I do want to go back to Pierre Thomas, our chief justice correspondent. And Pierre, you, you made the point earlier that there were law enforcement officers who worked with Derek Chauvin who testified in court against his actions on that day. Clearly, that was a big part of this sentence. It, it clearly was because in no way did anyone who uh, I would consider a professional law enforcement official uh, think that this was the appropriate way to handle that case. And when, if you take a step back from this case, if you look at the issue that everyone is sort of talking about around the edges, at the end of the day, this is a human story. And this is a, a story about race as well. Uh, you recall that when police responded to the scene, this was not about a crime of violence. This was not an armed robbery. This was not about an assault. This was about a counterfeit $20 bill. At the end of the day, 
George Floyd is dead over a $20 counterfeit bill? And that's the question that many African Americans and many people uh, are wondering about why is it that that man died over something that simple? Really hits home, Pierre Thomas, for us. Thank you. I also want to bring in Terry Moran for another final thought here. Terry, as we are seeing people show up there at the memorial site there in Minneapolis, I wonder what this sentence is going to mean as word spreads across the country. I, you know, that is now an iconic place in American history and, and in the world. People come from all over the world to go to the place that is now known as <clears throat> George Floyd Square. And I think in our history, sometimes you're living through history and you kind of don't notice it. It, it. it passes by relatively uneventfully. Every single American knows that from the moment you saw that video, from the moment the country saw that video, the shock and, and horror, the, the, the visceral response every decent human being had to that video, we've been living in a moment of American history. And we've been living the history of our oldest challenge in this country, 400 years of it. Can we live together in real justice and harmony. This is a chapter in that. Uh, this sentence today, you know, probably will be seen uh, as a step forward, but we know our history. It's one step forward, lots of steps back, but, but the, the country is awakened to this issue in a new way. George Floyd likely, let's hope, did not die in vain. Terry, thank you. And we're seeing more people there in Minneapolis showing up at that memorial site. Deb, I want to go back to you. We were actually talking before the sentencing hearing began about healing and what this would actually mean for, for healing the country that has been through so much over the course of the last year. Ben Crump himself says one step closer to healing. And I, and I see you've been talking to a lot of people about this. Well, you know, I think for so many people, it's hard not to feel the personal uh, uh, effects of this, even as Terry just talked about. We all went through this trauma, um, not just black people. And I'm the mom of a black son, and I certainly have felt it. I mean, but we all witnessed this, and we went through this case and this, this, this trial. So it's been a traumatic time, I think, for a lot of people. We know that there's still more charges to come, more officers to face charges in this case. But this this kind of closes the chapter on this part of the George Floyd story. And I do believe that for some people, there will be some measure of satisfaction. Doesn't happen very often, particularly when it is a, a black uh, a person who was lost at the hands of police. But I think for a number of people, and certainly I would say for this mom, it is nice to see that this case is sort of put to rest, at least for now. And I think that for a lot of people, this will be maybe some measure mm -hmm. of healing. Like you said, closing one chapter. There still is more to this story. Absolutely. Deborah, thank you so much. And thanks to our entire team for the coverage of Derek Chauvin's sentencing, 22 and a half years in prison. Our coverage on this story continues on ABC News Live and ABCNews.com. Of course, we'll have a full wrap-up on this and that breaking news out of Florida, that 12-story building collapse. Our David Muir is there covering the tragic events. He will be there live tonight for World News Tonight. For the entire team, I'm Whit Johnson in New York. Have a good day. This has been a special report from ABC News.